Hello everyone, the title of my lecture is Self-Managed Organizations by Integrative Intelligence. I will introduce myself. My name is Shada Nandram and I live in the Netherlands and I'm married, have two children. I was born in Suriname, a country in South America. My roots are from Rajasthan. My grandparents immigrated from Old Jodhpur in 1901. I've studied both psychology and economics at the University of Amsterdam and I did my PhD in social psychology at the Freie University in Amsterdam. Currently, I'm professor at the Nairobi Business University in the Netherlands. We are the only private university in our country. I'm also consultant at Brown Group, where we focus on integrative self-managed organizations. There we apply integrative intelligence. In this capacity, I'm also innovator at the Dutch Health Home Care, Butzorg. We also set up a joint venture in India, and I'm one of the members of the board. We see more and more the tendency of management to look at organizational innovation. The scholars have started to uh, label these as new economy type of organizations, and they come up with several concepts, such as new age, high trust organizations, conscious organizations, high purpose and meaning organizations, holacracy, agile, teal, mindful, and also self-managed organizations. What the new economy types usually attempt is to achieve effectiveness, efficiency, ethical, entrepreneurial climate in organizations, and also where employees enjoy their work. So they strive for the five E's, efficiency, effectiveness, entrepreneurship, ethics, and enjoyment. Doesn't this sound very promising? Yes, indeed. How they do that is something which I will share with you today. First, I will talk about conditioning. This concept is known by the work of the scientist Pavlov. The second will be integrative intelligence. This is a concept which I founded myself with my co-founders Puneet Binlish and Wim Kaiser. And the third concept in this lecture is Butzorg. For bringing that understanding, I need to address the following three concepts in my lecture. As a management professor, have you ever considered an organization without managers? Well, that is the case at the Dutch home care organization called Buurtzorg. It is an innovative way of organizing where nurses work in self-managed teams. You can say they are leading themselves. Let me first start with the work of Pavlov to talk about this first concept of conditioning. Ivan Petrovich Pavlov was a Russian physiologist and he is widely regarded as one of the founding fathers in physiology, in general and classical conditioning in particular. He developed theories on conditioning based on his experiments with dogs. He conducted these experiments in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In 1904, Pavlov won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the rich insights he provided into conditioning. Those insights worked his findings to develop ways of influencing customer behavior and methods of attracting customers. In general, his insights in conditioning have boosted consumerism. At the same time, economists have been inspired to build theories and practices by replacing Pavlov's dogs with human beings. One of the main questions managers in corporations have tried to answer is, how can an employee be conditioned? Usually, the main aim in this regard is to generate predictable outcomes to serve organization goals as well as the interests of the board of directors and shareholders. The few that individuals can be controlled through conditioning dominates the business environments. However, in recent years, people have started to question this control mechanism. Some base their concern on ethical, philosophical, or economic foundations. Discussions have arisen as how conditioning is manifested in procedures, rules, and regulations, and how important is that uh, compared to simply trusting people and providing them with a space to handle the tasks for which they are naturally suited. I'm not going to say in detail how conditioner works, 
uh, you can watch the experiment of Pavlov on the internet. He has done experiment with dogs like food and the moment they see food they get this salivation in the mouth which he measured under different conditioning. Let me explain this with the figure. Let us look at the upper left quadrant of the figure. As dogs are dependent on food for survival, the presence of food naturally causes salivation. The food is an unconditioned or natural stimulus. Now let us look at the upper right quadrant of the figure. Pavlov used a bell to replace that natural stimulus in his experiment. The first time he used the bell, it did not cause salivation as it was a natural stimulus. Let us look at the lower left quadrant. When he repeated over the food while ringing the bell, the dog started to salivate. Then let us look at the lower right quadrant. After a while, the food was no longer required to induce salivation. The sound of the bell was sufficient. This process is called conditioning. Further in his experiment, he showed that intensive conditioning is not sustainable. For example, when he chose for an overdosis, such as violent ringing of the bell, then there was less or no salivation in the dog. After a while, he even demonstrated that every conditioned stimulus became completely ineffective on repetition. The natural reflex action ceased. In business terms, this implies that too much control will eventually fail to have the desired effect. In other words, control systems, other than conditioning, may be more conducive in the long run. To enhance consumerism and for marketing purposes, businesses have created several conditioned stimuli to generate artificially conditioned reflexes. Such principles are also now applied in organizational design, employee policies and career development. On revisiting Pavlov's experiment, we would like to shift our attention to a new inference that can be made. Conditioning weakens the natural instinctual response of the subject. Given this view, what are the longer term consequences of conditioning? Let me share some of my thoughts. In a business context, the introduction of employee conditioning may be at the long run have a negative effect. Employees will not be able to use their natural ability to respond to certain situations regardless of whether the negative effect is directly detrimental to the organization. Eventually, the organization is making costs as it uses resources to handle situations that would otherwise have been taken care of by people's instinctual, intelligent, natural responses and it may be directly affect an organization's bottom line without an observable direct connection between the conditioning process and the impact of the drop in natural responses elsewhere. Now I would like to introduce the second concept of this lecture which is integrative intelligence. Let us look at this cube. Everyone can have his own view. If I ask a person on the right side he will only see the right side of the cube. The person on the left will only see the left side. If I ask them what do you see, each will see something else. Both are right. In order to have a comprehensive idea of the cube, the person has to consider the other views too. When we talk about integrative intelligence then, we aim to arrive at this comprehensive view. We call it coherent view. Compared to the other types of intelligence, this type starts with the aim to realize coherency, a coherent view. And this is important in an organizational setting as we all are part in the whole system and each one contributes in his own, own way to that whole system. Usually conflicts happen 
due to the lack of this coherent view. How is integrative intelligence different compared to other types of intelligence? We do not aim universal approach, but we say integrative intelligence has an observer-centric approach. We do aim coherency. It can be applied to understand something, to make decisions, to solve a problem. If we are exposed to diversity or complexity and large number of views, we need to use our intelligence more effectively to achieve the coherent view. This can be very useful to any organization as one can effectively use the resources and do not waste resources. Integrative intelligence covers both intelligence of human beings and intelligence in systems. This could be IT systems, but also procedures, rules, regulations in organizations. Now, let us go back to the link with conditioning. The statement that I want to make in this is that integrative intelligent mindset creates room for natural reflexes. Let me explain this. Conditioning can happen explicitly and implicitly. Conditioning methods include but are not limited to processes, policies, guidelines, organizational workflows and IT systems. On its own, conditioning is not good or bad. The dynamic assessment of these processes, guidelines and systems requires a form of intelligence that we term integrative intelligence. Therefore, we say integrative intelligence is the ability to discern how much individual intelligence and system intelligence can be built into the organizational design while maintaining the natural instinctual responses of employees and others involved in the organizational context. Now, I would like to move on to the third concept of today, the concept of Bützorg and its self-managed approach. I will briefly tell you about the company Bützorg, an example of a self-managed organization in which the lack of formal conditioning has made its employees more adept a self-managed process. It started from care delivery model for home visiting, personal nursing care. It aims optimal autonomy. There are independent teams, maximum of 12 nurses, and they serve 40 to 50 clients. They do assessment and care. They work as generalists. They work as self-managed teams in complete process, finding clients, hiring nurses, planning, thinking about their own education and finance. They coordinate all activities. The formal organizational structure is very flat. There are two directors, 55 staff members, 20 coaches, and they operate with 950 teams. And in total, there are 14,000 nurses and they serve 70,000 clients. There is a complexity reduction by the use of information technology. There is also external expertise in the form of a supervisory board, e-care IT system and training institutes for training people how to behave in self-managed teams. At Bürtzor we consider informal networks more important than formal networks. The Bürtzor model is gaining attention across the globe. You can see that we are active in several parts of the world. Now let us move on to make the link with the concept of conditioning and integrative intelligence. These were the two other concepts in my lecture today. There are a few lessons. The first one is conditioning kills integrative intelligence. Many forms of conditioning can have a negative impact on an individual's integrative intelligence, which is an innate human ability 
and subsequently on one's own ability to be part of a self-managed organization. Self-managed organizations are a new type of business that is agile, they are highly productive and FUCA ready. FUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. The second lesson, self-management structure enhances natural reflexes. The more the organization embodies integrative intelligence, the higher the tendency will be to adopt an organizational design with self-managed organizational structures and decentralized decision-making authority. Such a structure requires less conditioning. The third lesson, Bürtzorg deconditions nurses to support return of natural reflexes. The company's founders aimed to introduce an alternative organizational design for home care. They were driven by the conviction that an organization's governance and organization structure significantly influences how employees behave and solve problems on a daily basis. They noticed that bureaucratic business structures, which are characterized by many rules and regulations, decrease employees' natural problem-solving tendencies. Today, after 12 years, the company has proved that autonomy increases the natural tendency of nurses to be creative, enthusiastic, pragmatic, solution-driven and highly productive. The fourth lesson, business processes can be simplified and integrated. Bürtzorg's philosophy manifested in an approach that can be labeled integrating simplification. It aims avoiding wasting tangible and intangible resources such as time spent in meetings, procedures that are not meaningful and tasks that are not mindful for either nurses or clients. Usually, the clients are mobilized to empower themselves and use their available resources. The fifth lesson, it reduces cost, make organization effective, efficient, ethical, entrepreneurial, and joyful. Other industries have been inspired by this way of working, which reduces overhead costs, increases the level of employee em engagement, productivity and creativity, and it enhances customer satisfaction. Well, what is the way forward? The Bursorg case highlights a possible way forward. It has received a lot of attention from healthcare industry at the international level and other industries are also experimenting with the self-managed approach. However, the main point is being missed in many of these experiments, the notion that it all starts with the mindset. This requires that organizations let go of conditioning in order to encourage natural responses. The Bürtzorg case offers some guidelines on designing a business without or with minimum of conditioning and how such a design affects client and employee satisfaction, leading to high productivity and saving resources that would otherwise go to waste. To conclude, overall Pavlov's findings have led to new insights for marketing experts on how to condition the human mind for mass consumerism. However, in the current economic arena, consumerism is often viewed as a problem from the perspective of circular economy, the shared economy and sustainability goals. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can write to me, to my email address s dot nandram at nairode dot nl. Thank you.